The ocean, a wild and wonderful marine amusement park of biodiversity. But have you ever wondered if the ocean is too diverse? Because what terrible nightmare world would allow this to exist? This episode is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. More details to follow. It's 1848. Karl Marx is publishing the Communist Manifesto, the Niagara Falls has stopped flowing for the first and only time, and Captain McQuay of the HMS Day Dallas has just spotted a 100-foot sea serpent off the coast of South Africa. McQuay describes the creature as being full of large, jagged teeth, sufficiently capacious to admit a tall man standing upright between them, and even whipped up a sketch of the 60-foot creature. Some suggested the creature could be an ancient plesiosaur, others a giant gulper eel, and one even went so far as to propose it could have been a giant boa constrictor. Which is worse, a dinosaur or a 60-foot long ocean snake? Please vote now. Unfortunately, we'll never know exactly what it is that McQuay saw. We know more about the surface of the moon than we know about the bottom of the ocean, and it's been over 150 years since that sighting. It could be almost anything, because the ocean is a lawless wasteland. But it's possible that they saw the adult form of what Danish research vessel Dana caught in January 1930. Anton Brun, one of the scientists involved in the expedition, identified an almost completely transparent fish, about six feet in length, as Leptocephalus, a small, clear-bodied larva of other ocean eels. The problem is that typical Leptocephalus are around five to ten centimeters, or two to four inches, and they can easily grow to be up to and over six feet in length normally, but consider if this thing they found was only a baby. How big could it grow to be? Well, Brun did the math for us. I really wish he hadn't, but he did. Brun took common eel larvae and extrapolated their growth and applied it to the creature that he found. He estimated that the monster could grow to an adult length of over 180 feet. That's 55 meters. That's over the length of a full-size Olympic swimming pool. The worst part is that both McQuay and Bruin encountered their creatures off the coast of South Africa, both by the Cape of Good Hope. More like Cape of Good Nope. So if they are of the same species, we know where their stomping grounds are. There was another incident in 2003 where yachtsman Olivier de Cursesson found a mysterious creature had trapped his vessel. He says something that had wrapped up their rudder and that it was bigger than a human leg. He said that, the whole animal must have been nearly 30 feet long. It had glistening skin and long arms with suckers, which left impressions on the hull. Have any idea of what it could be? What it is, is an H.R. Giga monster come to life. It was most likely the Architutus dux, or as it is better known, the giant squid. The giant squid is known as one of the largest invertebrates on Earth. Their actual size is disputed, but statistically they can grow to around 65 feet long from head to tentacle which is about double the length of a typical yellow school bus. The mantle, which is just the main body portion of the squid, can grow up to 10 square feet, with eyes about a foot in diameter. Giant squids have two long feeding tentacles, which are covered in thousands of toothed suckers they use to pull prey within range of their eight other tentacles. Once an animal is trapped within the arms of this Lovecraftian horror, they are pulled in towards the sharp beak at the center of its mantle, where prey is sliced up into bite-sized fish giblets. Have you ever seen one of these little marble boys rolling around in your bedroom? Oh, those little roly polies, I, I love those things. But what would you say if I told you they could grow to, like, I don't know, the size of a small cat? You'd want to burn your house down, right? Because that's what I considered doing when I found out about this, but hold on to those Molotov cocktails for a second. They can only grow that large at the bottom of the sea. I don't light anything on fire anymore. Crustaceans of the genus Bathonomus, like their smaller cousins, have the ability to roll into a ball when in danger, protecting their soft, chewy insides with a hard carapace. They primarily live at the bottom of the ocean, but they do have the ability to swim freely through the water. Some have even been found at relatively shallow depths, so it is believed that they vertically migrate at times. Isopods are carnivores, but they are also what's known as facultative predators, which are defined as predators that both hunt and scavenge for food. They are also known to be able to go extended periods of time without eating. Interestingly enough, there was a giant isopod in Toba Aquarium in Japan's Mie Prefecture named simply Number One who decided to stop eating in 2009, and didn't eat anything until it passed away in 2014. 
Number one even learned that their caretakers wanted them to eat, so they started pretending to nibble on fish just to appease the humans around them. The venerable Neil Gaiman once said, I think hell is something you carry around with you, not somewhere you go. And as beautiful and poignant as that is, he's dead wrong. Hell is at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. Now I hear you asking, why, Brew? Why? It's just filled with salt water and crude oil. Remember this? I wish that I didn't, but I, I do, and here we are, still talking about it. About 200 miles off the coast of Houston, Texas, at the oil platform Perdido, a remote-operated vehicle, or ROV, spotted the long tendrils of some mysterious creature floating some 2,294 meters or one and a half miles under the sea. Jürgen Guerrero Comritz for the Biodiversity Data Journal characterized this monster as a member of the genus Magnapina, otherwise known as the Big Fin or Long-Armed Squid, but the exact species is up for debate since it's hard to discern anything else from the shaky ROV footage. We know this because of the thicker regions of the arms and tentacles held at nearly right angles to the body axis, and the presence of a large central fin along the mantle, the body of the squid. What makes these squids so unique is not just their size, but specifically their length. The Magnapina in the video is estimated at about 8 meters long, by comparison to the size of the riser, that oil drum looking thing in the video, but again, it's very hard to tell exactly. Scientists typically determine the total length of the Magnapina is about 12 times its mantle length, though only 11 specimens are known and deposited in collections worldwide, so most of what we know about the Magnapina is speculation. Scientists believe that it eats by dragging its tentacles across the seafloor and snatching up smaller creatures. The question is, how smart is this creature? If the Magnapina is an active predator, one that deliberately hunts different animals, then we can assume that it would be quite smart. Other cephalopods, like cuttlefish, are able to recreate the colors, patterns, and textures of their environments with their skin. Some squid can even deliberately edit their own DNA, and there are octopus which are able to learn by watching the behaviors of others. So it could be a hyper-intelligent deep-sea tripod straight out of War of the Worlds, or, you know, just a dangly drifter boy floating through the abyss. Bro. I'm ashamed to be your friend. Okay. You left out so many important details. Oh, uh, I mean, if you have anything you'd like to contribute- How about the fact that Magnapina squid are actually time travelers? Or that all crustaceans possess latent psychic abilities? And eels? You mean water snakes? Not a fan, bro. Yeah, I've got a guy you should check out. Here we see the majestic moray eel in its natural habitat. This isn't for real. No, it absolutely is. Huh. Fair point, but still wrong. Folks, you need to be careful about where you get your information. Staying informed is a job we take pride in, but that job has become a lot easier after partnering with our most recent sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is an on-demand subscription-based video learning service. What makes these courses so great is that they've got one for basically everything. No, seriously, I mean, there are more than 11,000 video lectures. Philosophy, birds, the dark ages. If you've been looking to expand your knowledge in a field that interests you, there's very likely a great course to do just that. Come on, you think I'll just believe anybody on the internet that easily? No. I mean, wait, yeah, you, yes, but generally, no. With The Great Courses Plus, you don't even have to worry about where your information is coming from, because every class is organized by professors from renowned universities and experts who have worked with National Geographic, the Smithsonian, and the Culinary Institute of America, just to name a few. We even use their service while researching this episode. Oceanography, exploring Earth's final wilderness, with Professor Harold J. Tobin, particularly the fifth lecture, Habitats, Sunlit Shelves to the Dark Abyss, which offered some great insight regarding today's very topic, how organisms on the ocean floor differ from their shallow relatives. You know what uh, this sounds like? School. Nice try, Hermit. Well, you could say that, except there aren't any tests, deadlines, or schedules, and you could educate yourself at a pace that you're comfortable with across a myriad of devices, like your TV, phone, or desktop. Uh, uh, grill? Oh my, they got a video titled How to Walk Like a Cat. Why didn't you just leave with that? God, you could have saved us so much time. Speaking of time, if any of this has sounded interesting to you, now is the best time to get on board. There's a free trial to get yourself started, or you can sign up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash brew. By signing up, you're not just supporting us and the channel, but you're supporting yourself and the art of edutainment, and I think that's pretty cool. So, thank you to the Great Courses Plus for this opportunity, and without further ado, let's get back into it. There isn't a scientific consensus on why exactly creatures living at the lowest depths grow so much larger than their shallower relatives. 
There are theories that could explain in part why this occurs, namely Bergman's rule and Kleber's rule. Bergman's rule is that as an environment grows colder, the animals that live there tend to grow bulkier. For example, the polar and Kodiak bears are the largest species of bear on Earth, and they both make their homes near and within the Arctic Circle. The deeper down you go, the colder it gets. Without light from the sun, we would be both blind and frozen. As we travel deeper, light would become more and more scarce, making the environment colder and darker. Some deep sea creatures would have to grow to larger sizes than their shallower cousins to maintain their body heat. Kleber's rule is that as an animal grows larger, their bodies become more efficient. This is measured in how many calories a creature uses per second, or their metabolic rate. The idea is that as an animal grows larger, the amount of energy they expend per second becomes more efficient, and they can go longer without eating. For example, a squirrel will objectively eat less than a blue whale, but the squirrel metabolizes energy significantly faster, and therefore must feed more often. Since food at the bottom of the sea is limited, it stands to reason that animals there would follow Kleber's law and grow larger to become more efficient. Keep in mind that these theories were invented for and tested with animals that live on the surface of the Earth, not at the bottom of her oceans. The effect of intense water pressure on these theories has not been fully explored, so we should not follow these as gospel. They simply offer some possible explanations as to why deep sea variations of common ocean creatures grow to nightmarish sizes. Human history is fraught with stories of sea monsters, of dragons and creatures of mythical origin. While we have managed to chart, most of, the dark corners of this earth, the bottom of the ocean continues to be a realm of unworldly creation. The creatures we find down there might fill us with fear and confusion, but it is the curiosity toward the unknown that arguably helps make us human. There is a quote I recall. It says that, We are the middle children of history, born too late to explore Earth, born too early to explore space. But it's wrong. There will always be mystery wherever or whenever we happen to be. It's just up to us to find it. Who knows, it might just be waiting for us to swim deep enough. Walk like a cat, walk, walk, walk like a cat, meow, 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 meow.